All right, 10 minute snack. Everyone knows the rules. Let's eat. Today, we, I have the great pleasure of talking with Sally Norton, uh, the author of an upcoming book I'm excited to read called Toxic Superfoods and a special molecule. I don't know if special is the right word uh, that is in these superfoods, quote unquote, superfoods. Sally, thanks for being on here. Thanks for having me, Kevin. This is fun. So I, I wanted to start with this question uh, that led with a little bit of backstory. One is I wrote an article five, six years ago on the health dangers of oxalates is what it was called. And I actually referenced a good amount of your work in the article. And it had become by far one of the top three articles I've ever written. It's been shared the more than any other article. So the awareness has definitely grown around these oxalates. Uh, I think a lot of thanks to you and your work. But my question is this, after I'd written that article, and it, it had a lot of attention, I got many, many messages that was relating everything to oxalates. So I, this is kind of an interesting place to start, but I'm curious your perspective on how, not only how prevalent oxalates are, but how responsible are they for the myriad of symptoms that people are having these days? Yeah, that's the big $64,000 question. It really would be great if we had a whole institution at NIH looking into this and really ask that question. And sadly, we haven't. So we don't really have a way to answer that question. But when you understand the science, which took a while digging and digging and digging because it's scattered all over like basic biology and then the various specialties and so on, you realize that the, the poisoning of oxalate down there at the cellular level, the way that it's messing with vascular tissue and the organs is so destructive to the fundamental function of cells. And it even affects how the cells read their own genome. So you can mess up cells in really basic ways. And it sucks the energy basically out of the tissues because the individual cells don't have enough mitochondria. They don't have enough energetic power to reproduce themselves appropriately. You get tissue weakening in many different angles way down there at the physiology of the cell. So yeah, lots of stuff can go wrong. And it's very interesting that the set of key symptoms that get created, the destruction of connective tissue, the failure of vascular tissue, uh, energetic problems, uh, weakening of all kinds of uh, tissues and functions, it looks like aging. You know, and we've been eating a lot of plant foods now for 400 years, and it's getting like on steroids right now. Plants are supposedly so great for us. And we have this real lopsided attitude in science as well as in culture that plants are probably fine and benign and are put here for our use and they're perfect for us. But that's not scientifically appropriate. And so I would say that pretty much a common chemical that we're all eating too much of could be causing all of the most common problems we're suffering from. You know what? So what's super interesting is back in 2016, I want to say it was. So quite a few years ago, uh, one of the things that led me on this journey was oxalates played a role in it. So I went on, did this little experiment. I was like, look, I'm going to remove oxalates and plant-based lectins from my diet. But when I did that, it basically left me with only animal foods because after you remove those two things, there's not many plants foods left. So I'm, I'm curious, high level overview, uh, what are the worst offenders of these oxalates and Basically, what can a diet look like that, that is low in oxalates? Yeah, so there are some plant foods. I mean, most of the leafy greens are not very high in oxalate. There's only four of them. But the reputation is that leafy greens are high in oxalate. So the four bad ones are chard, beet greens, which is the same thing, and spinach and sorrel. Hardly anyone eats sorrel in the U.S. Yeah. But it's only like three major hitters or two, chard and spinach. The rest of them are fine. Uh, but it's more than just spinach. It's the nuts, especially cashews and almonds are the worst. Peanuts are very bioavailable oxalates and the common nut that's everywhere. Yep. Uh, a lot of the beans, the true beans, the black beans and so on, they're pretty high in oxalate and lectins are pretty awful <laughs> in both scores, but the peas are not so high. So if you know how to deal with a lectin problem, 
lectins are manageable sort of you can soak and sprout and then high heat and because they're giant proteins that will denature they will change with the physiology of sprouting and then with the high heat you can nail them but nobody high heats a lot of those you know fruit i mean are you going to pressure cook your fruits that's right <laughs> But fruits are, you know, tolerable for a lot of people. And this is many of the fruits have the oxalates that are the crystal form, which is quite mm, potentially problematic because it's grit, glass, shardy kind of rough stuff. But if you have a really solid digestive tract, you can tolerate some of those crystals in a moderate amount. But maybe if you go all fruitivore and you starve yourself of proteins and nutrients, you know, those crystals become that much more dangerous. So, you know, the degree of frailty, the, the growth phase you're in, if you're a young child, they're very toxic. The oxalate, it's major toxicity is not just that it messes up the cells, but it messes up your nutrition mm -hmm. because fundamentally you can't get uh, adequate minerals in your diet when you're eating a high oxalate food. And when you're a growing child, that is devastating to have calcium and other forms of mineral deficiencies. So the other high worst offenders include the sort of all the gluten substitutes like buckwheat and teff and, and um, oh, you know, what am I, I'm, almond flour. I mean, just think about like yep. quinoa. These things are like the pseudo grains are high and the nut replacements and even the arrowroot starch and some of the junky right. starches that are used. They're, they're not good. So if you go on a gluten-free diet and you insist on having broad muffins, pancakes, you're likely gonna get into oxalate land and, and have too many oxalates in your diet. That's the last thing you need because the reason you're doing gluten-free is because your gut health is terrible. <laughs> and when you have bad gut health, you are a hyper absorber of oxalate, which means way too much is getting from your food into your bloodstream and landing in your liver. Then it goes to your heart and your lungs, all through your vascular system. The glands like to pick it up, the lymph tissues pick it up and your poor kidneys have the job of cleaning up that mess day in and day out. So, you know, these common foods like peanuts, potatoes are another one, French yep. fries, chips, the baking potatoes, very popular foods. And then there's a good old chocolate. Yep. <laughs> Favorite, very bioavailable. It gets in very quickly and easily into the bloodstream. It's often used in research studies because, hey, you're going to get paid to eat some chocolate and have, give some blood and urine. People will do that. <laughs> it's yep. a great way to design a human absorption study or so on. You, you triggered me so many questions. So I'm going to start with one of the top ones. You mentioned fruits. Uh, I, and I'm curious about your position on vitamin C. So a lot of people are eating fruits. Like I want all this vitamin C and excess vitamin C can be converted to oxalate. So are you against high vitamin C supplementation or eating a lot of fruit in general? as part of a dietary strategy. It, it, you'd have to eat a lot of fruit to really overdo the vitamin C in fruit. I mean, your best source of vitamin C is lemon juice. And one lemon is about 30 or something milligrams of vitamin C, which is within our capacity to handle. Uh, the body's designed to handle oxalate. Oxalate's in nature. You create a little in your metabolism. So there's a there's a capacity that you can live within and, and mm -hmm. you're, you're designed to live within the bounds of your capacity. But the way we're eating now, we've just like blown the roof off of that. So, but lemons and other fruits and lettuce is a great source of vitamin C and red pepper and so on are high vitamin C, but you really cannot hyperdose yourself with those foods. It's when you get into supplements and unfortunately, a lot of modern packaged foods like faux orange juice and, and electrolyte drinks and stuff are loaded with added vitamin C. So you could be taking a deliberate intentional supplement and then unintentionally consuming a lot of vitamin C and fortified foods. So it's easy to get into trouble with vitamin C and it's become like standard prevention for 20 years. But now with COVID, people are being highly pressured to use vitamin C supplements as some kind of prevention device, which it probably isn't. Yep. One thing you said that it hits close to home is I updated the oxalate article last year after my dad has been in the ER for the third time with kidney stones. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you mentioned here that I think is important maybe to talk a little bit about is gut health. He is metabolically, you look at him, he's healthy, uh, fit, et cetera, et cetera. But internally is another question, and he's had gallbladder taken out. And one of the things is he can't eat without basically taking a pill. And he's taken, he's been a 
high stress person his whole life. He's lived on ibuprofen. And when I would talk to him, I'm like, I think the gut health is kind of the big issue here. And it may not be that you're on a high oxalate diet, but the oxalates that you are eating are not getting basically broken down in the digestive tract and eliminated. You're absorbing them uh, because of poor gut health. So is, is that something that I guess this is kind of a two-part question. One is, is that kind of a, a root cause? And two is, are the oxalates actually contributing to the gut damage as well? They definitely contribute to gut damage. They're very hard on uh, tissues and the gut is a very intricate place. It's just really just one layer of complex cells. They have a lot of jobs to do. And you know they, they're supposed to protect us and let a, the good stuff in. But whenever you got leaky gut or you have no gallbladder, you're not digesting fats very well without bile typically. And extra undigested fat will bind up uh, calcium in the fecal material and increase the amount of oxalate that's free to get into this into the blood because it's these small little ions and these small little molecules that just float in like any other you know salt or any dissolved element floats between the cells and those uh, what we call you know tight junctions they're like little bits of velcro that stick out proteins that stick out of the cells that hook them together the Velcro isn't hooked very well. And so you've got much broader spaces for this stuff to just flood in. And it can be five, six, seven times the normal absorption rate. So a very, you know, just a few bites of potato chip fries or something like that, or some you know Reese's cups, this is enough oxalate with someone with leaky gut or fat malabsorption, fat, poor fat digestion to be a hyper absorber of oxalate. And it's very toxic. And the more frail your gut is, the more this is a big problem. And they, they don't even, and the research suggests in many cases, you don't even have frank gut issues and you see this hyperabsorption. They're in the mm -hmm. studies where they find people absorbing 60 or 70% of the oxalates they're eating, they can't even explain why. So mm -hmm. you can be a hyperabsorber of oxalate even without something as obvious as having lost your gallbladder. Isn't that common in autism as well? It seems to be. It's certainly um, limited amounts of studies done on that. There's been limited research and, and limited interest in researching it, unfortunately. Yeah, because, that is unfortunate. Uh, it's really unfortunate. There's all this neurological damage that oxalate can create and, and inflammatory problems in immunocompromise, really, because you're destroying the function and the proper balance of a not inflammatory immune system. After you eat a high oxalate food, it goes right into the bloodstream and immediately starts causing inflammatory damage to the circulating monocytes. That's your defense system. And it turns on a pro-inflammatory conversation in the bloodstream and you start pouring out more of these cytokines and pro-inflammatory molecules. So you can create whole body inflammation, damage the uh, immune cells and make them less able to handle infections too. Yeah. So, so if you have chronic infections, like yeast infections and sinus infections, yeah. the last thing you need is chocolate and potato chips. <laughs> so I know we're running up on the end of our snack time, uh, but I want to talk briefly about your new book. It's on pre-order right now called Toxic Superfoods, correct? That's right. So when is this going to be fully available? Do we know yet? Yeah, they're saving the delivery date for okay. that juicy little moment when after Christmas, suddenly we get to worry about our health again. <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to stop caring from Thanksgiving to Christmas. So they're saving the book till after that because the, the media has a cycle when they start getting interested in talking about health. And since this is such a new topic for the mainstream conversation to bring this topic into the mainstream, which is mostly kind of sleepy about nutrition, you need to like do it when everybody's waking up. So we're you saving to, it. But if anyone by the rules. It is a great idea, pre-order it, get, get interested in the book and, and support the whole process of uh, the publisher getting behind the book too. Absolutely. So pre-order is open now. I said, check that out. Um, and it's, it's called super or excuse me, toxic superfoods. I absolutely love that title. Uh, perfect title and how oxalate overload is making you sick and how to get better. So I'm assuming the book is just dedicated towards oxalate specifically, or is there other, uh, I'll call them plant toxins that, that you dive into as well. Well, in chapter four, I dive in heavily into this whole cultural delusion that plants are so great for us and kind of explain the weakness and all of that. 
because people are shocked to learn that plants might have a dark side and we're so lopsided in our thinking this is so shocking i try to help you know talk them down from the cliff like if you eat a little less vegetables it's okay just relax (laughs) it'll be okay so basically i've jammed a ton of information about oxalates their history and why we don't know about them and what they're doing to us and how to get over them in hopefully a very readable book so and how to get over them is an important subject. I know because there's something called oxalate dumping that will, will leave our listeners in suspense uh, about how to get through the oxalate dumping. You have to check out our book uh, or leave us comments and we'll, I'll, I'll of course be in the, engaging in the comments. Uh, but thank you so much for the time, Sally. I am excited to read your book personally and, uh, and you're doing important work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. It's really fun. All right. Snack time's over. Did you enjoy the snack? If so, drop me a comment. Let me know if we should dive deeper and do a full meal on this topic. Also, P.S. If you liked the snacks, you're going to love our bites. A daily email bite. A golden nugget. Better than a pasture-raised egg yolk. All right, maybe not that good, but it is a daily bite to optimize your health and nutrition with a meat-based diet. Access right now is totally free. Link below. See you in the bites.